How did early neuroscience experiments help create one of the most classic horror stories of all time? Stay tuned. As you can see, this month on Sci vs. Sci, we're getting into the spooky holiday spirit and exploring how psychology can help us demystify the mysterious, explain the unexplainable, make the perplexing less, less purple. If you want to see all the weird and creepy things we've come up with, after all, that's kind of in our wheelhouse, consider subscribing. I'll talk while you press the button. Today, we're looking at how the real neuroscience of electrical activity in the nervous system inspired one of the most classic monster stories of all time. But this story has more than just monsters. It features one of the most infamous scientific feuds of all time, which resulted in a technology that you still benefit from today. And in fact, it's a safe bet you've got one of these things on you right now. Mysterious. It was a hot summer night in 1816 that Mary Wollstonecraft awoke from a nightmare that would become the inspiration for her classic novel, Frankenstein, the Modern Prometheus. She had traveled to Lake Geneva in Switzerland on vacation with hopes of fun-filled summer days, but the weather took a bad turn and a series of storms limited her to indoor activities with her future husband and their friend Lord Byron, who were both poets, and Byron's personal physician. To keep each other entertained, they told each other creepy ghost stories, but also tales of the latest developments in science. One of the most exciting developments that they discussed were the scientific musings of Erasmus Darwin, the famous naturalist and the grandfather of Charles Darwin, whoever that was. Erasmus Darwin was well known in Britain and good at capturing the people's imagination. And he was all too aware of the strange new substance known as electricity and its relation to the nervous system. But he didn't do this work himself. He was simply admiring the work of the real heroes of our story. In 1791, Luigi Galvani published his main work, summarizing 10 years of experiments that were truly revolutionary and established the scientific field of electrophysiology. But I said heroes. That's because there's a record that needs to be corrected here. Luigi's wife, Lucia, was a scientist as well and played a crucial role in these experiments. Of course, she got no credit for her work because she was of the lady persuasion. But we hope to feature her accomplishments in a future video. But for now, it's safe to say she deserves a fair bit of the credit for her work on these experiments. And what experiments would these be? Well, I'm glad you asked. Galvani was doing experiments with electricity in animal nerves. In the typical experiment, he would prepare a frog by carefully dissecting out the nerves to the legs and mounting them to a board. Gross. His wife would turn the crank on an electrical generator to build up static electricity and get a spark, and then she would touch the legs with a probe. To their amazement, the legs would jump as though the frog were still alive. To further explore the effect of electricity on nerves, they decided to study natural electricity like you would find in a lightning storm. They set up a rooftop experiment in the style of Ben Franklin's kite experiment where legs were attached to a wire attached to a lightning rod. Nice. The results were clear. Adding electrical impulses to freshly prepared nerves created signals in the nerves that caused movement. To quote Galvani, and still, we could never suppose that fortune were to be so friend to us, such as to allow us to be perhaps the first in handling, as it were, the electricity concealed in nerves, in extracting it from nerves, and in some way putting it under everyone's eyes. These words were so revolutionary in science, and it was so bizarre and captivating that everybody, scientists or not, started trying to reproduce muscle contractions in recently dead animals, especially frogs. 1791 was not a good year to be an Italian frog. One of Galvani's biggest critics, turned rival in this case, was Alessandro Volta. Volta conceded that frogs may be sensitive to the application of electricity from the outside, but he doubted that they had their own electricity stored in them somehow. So Volta set out to prove his case by doing frog experiments of his own. Now Volta wasn't a very skilled surgeon like Galvani was, 
So he really had a hard time replicating Galvani's work without damaging the delicate nerves. And so he used mostly intact animals instead of these careful preparations. Still, he was amazed that the frogs were more sensitive to electricity than his own delicate scientific instruments. Through his work, he became aware that using two kinds of metal plates pressed together, called bimetallic arcs, made it possible to store and release electricity. According to this explanation, Galvani's metal equipment, a steel scalpel against a brass plate that the frog leg was mounted on, was the source of the electricity, not anything stored inside the frog. So by using piles of these metal plates, Volta was able to cause not only muscle contractions, but other stuff like tongue sensations and flashes in the eyes and even more. Now, Galvani wasn't to be outdone, so he found a way to use a severed nerve on the leg muscle to get a contraction with no metal involved whatsoever. He separated and prepared the two legs of a frog with their sciatic nerve section as to make them as long as possible, up near the vertebral column. This time, he used a glass rod, not conductive, to move the nerve corresponding to one of the legs so that it would touch the other nerve in two places. If he could carefully get the cut end of the first nerve to contact the second nerve, then both legs would actually contract. To Galvani, this vindicated him, it proved he was right, and the electricity was in fact somehow stored inside the animal. Now, Volta at this point has shifted his energy to building bigger and bigger piles of these metal plates to generate more and more electricity, which came to be known as voltaic piles. Now, it turns out that it didn't work with just the metal, but when he added paper moistened with salt water between the plates, the first battery was born. Galvani died in 1798, just shortly after this whole exchange, and his work pretty much fell by the wayside for decades afterward without anyone acknowledging that he was, in fact, correct. Meanwhile, Volta was praised for his discoveries and became world famous. This was one of the most important disagreements in scientific history. It resulted in the invention of the electrical battery, which leads to the ability to harness electricity and the discovery of electromagnetism. It also resulted in the birth of the field of electrophysiology, which was foundational to modern neuroscience. When you hear the words volts or voltage and galvanized, think of Galvani and Volta. The measurement of electrical conductance on the surface of the skin is still called galvanic skin response, or GSR, and is still used to measure physiological arousal like they do in lie detector tests. Given its importance, it's no surprise that this exchange was deeply interesting to Erasmus Darwin, who brought it to the attention of the intellectual elites in the English-speaking world. The world was captivated by this strange discovery. Now, Galvani had a nephew named Giovanni Aldini, who followed in his uncle's footsteps studying galvanism, and in 1803 he traveled to London to attend the execution of a prisoner named George Forster. Once Forster was dead by hanging, Aldini connected the body to electrodes and started passing current through it. And this caused the face to contort, an eye to open, and the limbs began to flex and flop around, and the fists clenched. Onlookers were, needless to say, extremely disturbed by this and feared that he might be reviving Forster from the dead. In the introduction to her book, Mary, now known by her married name, Mary Shelley, specifically mentioned that the discussion of galvanism led to her nightmare that inspired her to write and publish her famous book shortly thereafter at only 19 years old. Of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't call attention to the book's lesson about ethical responsibility in science. Dr. Frankenstein becomes horrified by his creation, and this highlights the moral choices that come with scientific advancement. These issues loom large for many scientific problems, whether it be gene editing technology like CRISPR, nuclear power, or creating artificial intelligence and artificial life. Spoiler alert, I guess, but it's been around for over 200 years, so if you haven't read it by now, that's kind of on you. As the story progresses in the original novel, so does the creature, eventually being able to speak fluently and eloquently and advocating for himself and begging for justice and compassion. This leaves us to wonder, who was the real monster after all? Dr. Frankenstein or his creation? 
So that's how the story of neuroscience intertwines with the story of modern science fiction. If you like this video, help us out and hit the like button to say thanks. Consider subscribing for more creepy content on all things psychology. And until next time, keep thinking. In 19, Mary Shelley published one of the most classic and horrifying pieces of literature ever written, which still captivates audiences today. How old are you?